Hey everyone, welcome back to the Primal Blueprint Podcast. We got a repeat offender here today. Uh, one of my <laughs> really fun guy, Tyler Cartwright, was nearly dead 15 years ago. He weighed a quarter of a ton, was falling asleep while driving, talking, eating 1,200 calories a day. We will talk about his journey, his, his transformation, and also uh, really this whole journey being the subject of a book that he wrote. You have to say the first word of the title, though, Tyler, because I'm not sure I'm going to pronounce it right. So the first word of the title is Kinsukuroi. And that is? So it is the Japanese art of taking something broken and actually rebuilding it using gold lacquer um, or gold powder and lacquer. So uh, it's, it's, you know, I've joked after 300 pounds lost and being stitched and scarred together, I am very much a broken vessel. Yeah. Um, you know, so and now you coach people on this. You've uh, you, you co-founded Keto Gains with Louis Villasenor, mm -hmm. with Louis Villasenor, which we've had both of you on the podcast before mm -hmm. talking about keto and all of that. But I wanted to talk uh, specifically just to you about your, your, your new book and this whole journey. Um, and I guess, oh, you know, let's just start with. Um, all right. You talk about I mean, you weighed up at one point five hundred and five pounds. I did. Okay. And the daily food intake sometimes without desserts or snacks was like 9,000, 12,000 calories a day. Okay. You said you're like a small Bengal tiger or <laughs> you were weighed as much as a... that's where I weighed. Yeah. It was, uh, was a Bengal tiger's worth. Yeah. Um, we can talk a little bit about what got you there. Um, but I want to talk, let's, I will go all over the place here, but you know, one of the things that resonated to me and so many things resonated to me. And by the way, if you are out there listening to this and you know, anyone who's morbidly obese, you have to get this book. You have to send them to Tyler for a variety of reasons that you will find out in this podcast. But one of the things that I resonated with, even though I was never morbidly obese, but I did have the food obsessions and the food eating disorder issue going on there for a while. And I was like, oh, because I felt it when you were talking about how when you were that large, you're kind of like in this world where you're trying to pretend that you're not buying it for yourself. Like somehow, th you know, this whole game and I've been there, I've even been there. I've done that where I've ordered extra and I've been on the phone like, oh yeah, I'll get, and I'm like lying. I'm not on the phone. I'm like pretending to talk to, like, so that what? The person at the checkout thing, it doesn't judge me. It's a weird place to be. But here's the thing I've also noticed because I've been around morbidly obese people and I'm sure this is a move you guys make because of this, uh, which is, you know, they'll be out to dinner with people and they'll eat like kind of half the portion and then take the rest to go. And you're like, it, you're not full. You know what I mean? It, it's, it's a weird thing. So talk to us a little bit about that. Cause I think people out there will really, re you know, resonate with this kind of feeling. You talked about driving to certain fast food places and be like, Oh shit, did I already go there on Monday? Maybe I need to go to the one across town. Talk, talk to us about the mind frame of what that was like. So, you know, there's there's a couple of things that I, that I noticed um, and I worked. I think everybody does a tour through fast food when you grow up, um, you know, and, and you always knew the repeat offender customers are like the really unusual customers, really large, really skinny. The really churchy folks with a six foot seven guy that comes in with a five foot two wife. And like when somebody is out of the ordinary scope, you notice them and you remember them. And so I think in my head, I, if I kept some kind of a mental spreadsheet of like, did I go to this place? And if I spaced those out far enough that I wouldn't become the guy whose steering wheel rubbed his belly and his thighs every time he came to the drive through, you know, ordering two 20 piece chicken nuggets or, you know, going through and getting, you know, two milkshakes and two large drinks or whatever, you know, that was. Um, so, you know, and, and a lot of times you you get to a point where you would even go to multiple restaurants. So you would stop at one restaurant and then drive through to go. And so you would you didn't want to order entire... too much. From exactly. The one mm -hmm. Exactly. So you would start at one restaurant and you would plan your route to get to wherever you were going to go through both restaurants. And so, you know, oh, well, I really love the apple pies at McDonald's, but I like the chicken biscuits with some gravy from the, the Carl's Jr. The Hardee's and, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, I'm probably going to need a snack, some stuff at the gas station and get a, a Quest bar or whatever. Granted, Quest bars weren't a thing when I was going through this. But like you rationalize this multi-stop thing and somehow it lessens the reality that you're eating 10,000 or 5,000 or 6,000 calories at one sitting or at one meal because it comes in a different bag. Yeah. And I've just yet to figure out what that connection is. 
but I've talked to a number of people who have really struggled with weight, both from like an obesity perspective, but also just a binge eating perspective where they would go through this series and like these mental checklists, they would learn to look for the same cars in the employee area of the parking lot. And if the same cars were there as the last day, they would pull around like they forgot something and go to somewhere else. And Mm -hmm. it's weird mental gymnastics, but it is definitely some kind of ego protective. It is. It's like you're, you're, it's like, Somehow, if you do all of these things, which mean nothing to the outside world, it, it's just like this level of denial means like then this this problem doesn't exist. It's a strange thing, but I'm I'm so glad you brought that up in your book and you detailed that kind of shame and weirdness around that and what other people might have thought of you because everybody with binging issues has that, you know. I think, um, but particularly if you're morbidly obese, um, then let's get into the time when um, a real harsh moment, you got a letter from your mother mm-hmm. that was really brutal. And, um, you know, she kind of read you the right act there a little bit in a nice way, but you had fallen asleep during a conversation with her. Can you talk about the letter she wrote? You? Sure. So my parents had, had sort of pseudo retired. My mother kept working because why not? Um, after uh, they had done about a combined 80 years worth of educating, they were both in public education and they had a house in the lake that was kind of my dad's dream and a little bit of a mother's nightmare because she's kind of a city girl who didn't want to be that far away from everything. But, you know, we would go up and visit pretty often, especially before we had my daughter and, and you know, when, you know, both of our doofus dogs could be, you know, checked in or one of our neighbors could let them out so that it became less of an issue. And we had gone up to visit and multiple times during the course of a, just a conversation like this, as soon as I would st- you know, kind of finish what I had to say and listen for a response, I would just doze off in the chair and, you know, I would snap back to waking up, you know, almost instantaneously, but we're not talking, Oh, we're up at two in the morning, having a conversation. This is, you know, 30 minutes after morning coffee when everything should be bright eyed and chipper and the world is blue sunshine and whatever. And here I am just nodding off on a regular basis. And so, you know, it's not that I didn't know something was wrong, but it's just one of those things where you don't want to hear it. And so you, you put on kind of the horse racing blinders and you just could sort of convince yourself that like, as long as I don't look at it, it's not there. And it wasn't the first time. I mean, I would go to the office and then have no mental recognition as to how I even got there. Um, you know, I would have to pull over halfway between our office and and my house, which wasn't but about a 20 minute drive um, to stop at the Hardee's or the McDonald's on the way. Cause I was going to fall asleep if I didn't get some Coca-Cola or some kind of like biscuit and something to go along with. I could just lie to myself to say, hey, everybody stops every hour on a 10 hour drive to great grandma's house or whatever to get ice cream and stop at a buffet. You know, like, you know, every that's a totally rational, normal thing, because, you know, we need to stretch our legs anyway. And I'm a little hungry. And so, you know, it, it wasn't the first time. It was just probably the first time that my parents had really seen that. And it wasn't too terribly long after that I get a letter Um and she actually said, and Eleanor, you put me on the spot here because I always get a little misty. I'd want to tell the story. But, you know, she just said, you know, mothers aren't supposed to bury their sons. And for those of you that may be watching this that have, my heart goes out to you for sure. And, and I don't think she meant any offense by it, but that's not the right order of things. And she went on to basically say, you know, to, to recapture what she saw from her perspective of me sitting in a double wide chair, making it a single wide chair and just struggling even to breathe. Um, you know, my father had observed prior to that, that, uh, you know, we have a small hunting cabin on some land and I went up there for hunting season. And uh, he said, Tyler, you don't breathe for 90 seconds at night. And then you gasp for air. And he said, you know, he was through tears. I mean, my dad, I buried a treble, like a, a three prong fish hook in his back when I was a child. And I watched them clean a blade with kerosene and cut it out of his back. And he didn't make a sound. And this is my father with tears running down his face saying to me, you, I, I stayed up all night listening to you breathe. Cause I thought this is my son's last breath. And I need to hear, I, I have to 
hear it. I have to be there for it. And, you know, it was kind of on the heels of both of those conversations. And they were, you know, several, you know, a good period of time apart, but they were just kind of, okay, now it's not just my mom being hypercritical or over-concerned, and now it's not just my dad being melodramatic or kind of the, the ramblings of somebody who's getting older and more sentimental or whatever. There is legitimate concern from my dad who taught me the phrase, or are you hurt or injured from football coaching perspective? And, and my mother who always kind of clean, came behind and cleaned up and took care of all the stuff in the house and all the folks that needed help. So, you know, I, it just hit me at my core. And I'd love to say it was at that moment, you know, some biggest loser style thing where it's like, Oh, you know, magically I, everything was, was clear and my path was laid before me and this instant change, you know, this moment happened. Thank you. Motivational interviewing for this pathway. The reality is I was pissed. Like I, I literally, it was like, well, they're dead to me now. Right. And like you just I, judge me. Now I'm <laughs> shamed. Thanks for shaming me. Mm hmm. Hey. And for weeks, I mean, I barely wanted to speak to them when they'd call. I'd duck their calls and text back, going busy, sorry, or whatever, and just move on. You know, so to some degree, it, it really ripped my guts out. And I had to sit and, and kind of stew in it, right? And uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I wish to say like, oh, there was like this one simple trick or this one moment, but it was kind of a summary version of a lot of different events that occurred. That one was just the one that, you know, people will say, oh, you're a mama's boy. Um, I, I probably am, you know, nobody screws with my mom or we're going to have problems. And, uh, you know, for her to write that letter, first of all, oh my God, what strength somebody has to have to write that letter. And secondly, how bad did I have to be before she could bring herself to do something that could have severed a relationship right. with her youngest son? You know, that's a good way to look at it. Again, just kind of putting yourself in her shoes for a minute, as we all should, and empathetic and, and realizing that because when uh, the gravity almost increases when we kind of consider her point of view, doesn't it? Um so brutal. We're, we're so glad you're not there anymore. <laughs> um, let's That's talk a little bit about some of the, some of the just like awful things that happen to fat people, which is you broke your king size bed. You busted a chair in a restaurant. I cannot imagine the awful feeling that that is when that happens to someone who's morbidly obese. I can't even imagine, but tell us about a couple of those experiences. Um, sure. Like that. So, yeah, the, the bed breaking thing was kind of like, oh, this structural crap made from China. It's not good. You know, <laughs> you, you, you can always <laughs> rationalize. Yeah. Maybe I've got termites, you know, like you can always kind of rationalize nice. away a bed, you know, breaking. Maybe I sat in the wrong corner. I was right there on the edge of the frame. And yeah, I'm a bigger guy and whatever. The reality is the reason I was sitting on the edge is because I couldn't sit all the way up on the bed. And secondly, the reason that I was hunched over onto that one spot is it was the only way I could reach my feet. Um, so I literally had to go to one spot on the bed where my weight had actually divoted the, the mattress enough that I could get onto it and that I actually had to um, actually kind of had to sort of uh, it's almost impossible to replicate now, but sort of bring my foot up and rest it on the lip edge of the bed while rolling over my stomach to sort of reach my shoe. And I had to hold my breath at a deflated breath in order to reach it. Because if I inflated, I didn't have enough flexibility to actually put my own shoes on. Um, I heard a crack and then I went tumbling forward and the bed went tumbling down. Um, you can laugh some of that off. You call a friend and you say, Hey, look, I need to pick up some two by four and we need to build a new bed. Cause I broke this one, you know, cheap Chinese crap or whatever. And you just kind of <laughs> dismiss it. Um, so the story with the chair in the restaurant um, was kind of a, a peculiar one. Um, and I guess I should step back a little bit and actually tell the, the precursor to this story. It was not too long after I got the letter from my mother um, I had an F-150 truck and I did not fit in the seatbelt. Um, so if you've ever been in an F-150 truck and you're six foot or so like I was, um, that's really not a problem for most people, but the seatbelt just was not big enough for me. And so 
I had placed an online order with the Ford parts people to go pick up at my local dealership to get the seatbelt extender. And so I get to the, the parts counter, the order, you know, get the notification saying, Hey, your parts in no problem. And so I'm going to pick it up and L the young lady at the counter would have made you look obese. Um, I don't know if sizes come in negatives, but I'm pretty sure that she was like a negative four. Like a zero, uh, like this one was super tiny. Yeah. She's literally, she was inside out. We just, you know, like that, that's the it way it works. Like, like transparent. It was and like, here's the thing. And, and I don't want to begrudge in, or, or, or belittle struggles that people who have been uberly. My mother was herself, they called her Bugs Bunny because of her teeth and the fact that she was about as skinny as my arm all of her growing up. And she tells horror stories about the emotionality of that too. And so I don't want to sort of say, oh, fat sure. people have problems and lean people never do. But you know, I walked up to the woman and I said, hey, I'm here to pick up an online order. Here's the information. And she said, and what are you picking up? And I said, it's part number, you know, one, two, three, four, five, whatever it was. And, and she said, um, now, 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 what's that again? <laughs> I said, it's a seatbelt extender. And she said, she says, well, what, what, what does that do? And I'm like, what part of seatbelt extender is not clear in the name of the product? You know, when it I find it on its own, <laughs> I expect a cheeseburger. I don't expect two, two, two live fish sandwiched between like a piece <laughs> of cheese. That's not a cheeseburger. Right. And so, yeah, so, so I just was like, it's, my size. I can't, you know, and so I'm mortified to begin with. Like, have you ever had to describe how fat you are to somebody who literally would fit inside of one of your thighs? It's a difficult conversation to have. And so she goes, oh, okay, let me go see. I don't know if they're ready yet. She goes, you can stand over there. And, and so I'm in this waiting room. There's an Indian gentleman. There is a, a, like a, I'll say soccer mom. I don't know what else to sort of describe the, the person type. And myself against the wall, well, we weren't all against the wall. I stood against the wall because there were no chairs that would hold me. And some time goes by. And instead of just going, hey, large gentleman, the only one of three people who's still standing in the waiting room you know, for parts to pick that up and leave, she gets over the, the PA system and says, well, the gentleman who was here for seatbelt extenders, please come to the parts counter. Your order is ready. I've never been... Mortified. More mortified in my life at that point. No problem. You know, at that point until that moment. And so I grabbed seatbelt extenders about as fast as I possibly could. And I went out to the truck and jumped in my truck and I shotgunned it. So the answer to all problems is either food or drink. That's the, the rule of life when you weigh 500 pounds. And so, you know, my answer was to go to... Um, at the time, the restaurant, it's not there anymore, it was called the Lazy Donkey, or Del Burro Perezoso. Uh, they, they, on the signage, it was in English. On the, on the menu, they actually forgot to translate it, which is always the mark of a real Mexican restaurant, is there are just things that aren't translated. And so when I walked in, I had a table, and it was my table because it was the only table that I fit in. I actually looked one time and I spent during a course of several months, about $2,500 a month at that one restaurant. Oh my God. Um, okay. Wow. I was basically putting her kids through college and funding her 401k. I'm pretty sure, but this older lady. <laughs> she was real happy lady, to see you walk in. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> like you know, sort thing. of full, sort of full floral dress. Um, you know, she sees me, she literally moved a family off of the table and moved them to another table when I got there. And she ushers me over to the table. She didn't take my order. She knows what I want. I get the same thing every time I'm in there. Um, it was about- By the way, tell, tell us what you ordered because that meal is pretty crazy. <laughs> uh, two chicken chimichangas, extra rice, big bowl of cheese dip, extra chips, and leave the pitcher of Coca-Cola at the counter because uh, I'm going to drink it all. Uh, so they got to a point where they would literally just bring a pitcher of Coke instead of a glass, and I would just drink out of the pitcher. Um, they knew what to bring. They knew what to do. They knew how to make it. No beans, nothing remotely healthy in the conversation at all, except for maybe the chicken itself. Um, and about the time that they put the food on the table, I leaned back to kind of get out of the way because there's this international greeting at Mexican restaurants, hot plates, hot plates. And when they say it, you know, it's your food. And so I moved kind of out of the way to let them put the food on the table. And yeah, I heard a crack and I was like, oh, 
crap, I know what that sound, I remember it from the bed. <laughs> and uh, next feeling I had was my back and my head hitting the floor mm. and parts of a chair kind of poking me in the sides and all over my waist and abdomen and everything were coated in cheese and rice. Uh, the entire place had come to a complete stop to see the, the, the quarter ton man covered in cheese in the floor. And uh, I realized I had reached a new point of I've never been more mortified and embarrassed. And it had only been a few hours after the previous conversation. And so I dusted myself off, grabbed the $20 bill out of my wallet, which, by the way, was nowhere near enough to pay for all the food. And I threw it on what was left of the table and uh, I left. And so I go out to a spillway dam that's not terribly far from my house. And uh, my dad fished probably six or seven days a week, all of my growing up. And so I grew up on the water with him and water has always kind of calmed me, you know, the watching moving water, watching waves, it says something about like the transience of life or whatever. And, uh, and so I'm parked across on sort of the deep side of, of this, this small river. And I'm looking across and I realize that there's these children out there playing in sort of the lee side or like the shallow side where there is not much of a current and their parents are up there having a little picnic or like a little get together lunch or what have you. And, and I just had this existential moment where I realized I not only had I been failing as a son, I had been failing as an employee. Um, I had been failing as a husband, you know, in a sense, I had been failing as a father because we had no children and there was no chance for us having children, just given my current health and my wife's. And I was mortified. I was angry. I was disappointed. Um, I had cracked the window because AC can't blast cold enough when you're as big as I was. And, uh, and, you know, so here I am and I get so mad. I just rear back and started punching the steering wheel. And then I realized that it was making small honking sounds. And meanwhile, my window was slightly open while I was screaming at the top of my lungs about what a failure I was. And I was a 500 pound man with dried white cheese dip all over my lap with my pants button unbuttoned because they didn't fit comfortably if I was sitting down. And I just had this moment where it transcended from visceral anger to humor when I just started cackling and realizing that this family looks up to see what in the heck is going on. And I realized, like, if they call the police, I'm going to jail for something. Because, like, you can't get away with being coated in white, creamy cheese on your lap with your pants unbuttoned in a window a really with tears robot. streaking down your face. Like, literally, I've said before, that man's guilty of something with respect to, like, mug shots. And I don't know what it is. That was me at the moment. And I just was like, you know, first of all, I'm going to leave before the cops come. And secondly, uh, it sort of shifted my mindset to saying, if I consider myself dead already, is there a way to come back from this? And that's really kind of the moment that I think a lot of all of this stuff kind of came to a point of clarity was over a broken chair and me being covered in cheese dip. And ironically, I still have those jeans and that jacket to this day, and they still smell like Mexican, not like the, the tortilla chips. If you smell them, you can absolutely still smell Mexican food restaurant on them. Oh, wow. Uh, that brings me like your trip to the restaurant brings me to something you, you know, you, you talked about. And I, I've had this conversation with people before about food as your friend, like mm -hmm. when you feel rejected or when you feel like, again, the answer to something or speaking to another person who had these issues. And I've been here, too, where you're like oh, it's a Saturday night. I have nothing going on. I'm going to go get some bunch of fucking food and shit. And I'm going to go have a party with my Like, it's like you're, <laughs> it's a very strange thing. I used to do it all the time. Um, and it seemed like weekends were the worst, were the worst there for me if I had weekends open. Um, mm -hmm. I, and again, this is where, 
and, and you talk about this in the book and I, you know, we don't have to go into this in depth, but talking about like, you know, really examining your feelings, like, are they true? Right. Mm-hmm. What are you feeling in that moment? And then what is it bringing you to do? And I think all of us morbidly obese or not, when you have binging eating issues, you're not only constantly making bargains, but you're also using it as your friend. It's your, it's your go-to it's your, whatever. It's no different than lighting up a cigarette after you have a tough day or whatever it is. This is my, uh, my moment where I disclose how sophomoric my sense of humor is, but I don't know if you've ever seen the movie half fake that had Dave Chappelle in it. It's been, it's but there's a, a line in the movie well, there's a line in the movie where he said, Abba Zabba, you're my only friend. And you know, he takes a big old bite of the Abba Zabba bar. And like, that was the, the, the end of scene. Like it hadn't, but I've, I've thought about that a lot over the years. And I've thought like how many of us would call Ben and Jerry's or Jack Daniels or, you know, or Jim beam or, you know, uh, the local heroin dealer, whatever, you know, your friend, but it's really, they're all just coping mechanisms for the same issue. Yeah. And it kind of puts things into perspective when we would call one an addiction or one a problem. So you know, addiction to smoking, uh, drug abuse, whatever. And then when we look at, you know, even drinking, right. But then when you look at food, it's like the least objectionable version of the exact same behavior for the exact same problem. I have a difficult time coping with the situation that I currently have been facing or am facing. And so the answer to my problems, I can't promise it's at the bottom of a pint of Ben and Jerry's, but we can't be certain until I get to the bottom and see. And if it's not there, maybe I need to get a second pint, or maybe I need to see if it's in the bottom of the pop secret microwave popcorn, or maybe I need to, you know, there's always this mindset of it's, we don't say, oh, I'm looking for life's answers at the bottom of a glass, but the reality is we absolutely betray our real emotions by chasing down these false friends. Um, They're not your friends and they're not your enemies. Food is food. Drink is drink. You know, I enjoy a good drink. Well, you and I've shared drinks together, but like, you know, the reality is that's, that doesn't make it healthy when it transcends from things you do with friends to a thing you call a friend. Yeah, really well said. Give me an overall, um, from 505 pounds down to where you are now. How long did that whole process take in terms of like your weight, where you got to for like like a couple of years? So I was about 12 years dieting. Um, you know, when I work with people, sometimes they're like, you're so certain you, you, know, you tell me no to don't do this or whatever. I'm like, let me assure you, I've been down that path. Yeah. I'm an engineer by trade. So I actively look for every hack, every bypass loop, every shortcut, every, everything that I can possibly do. I have failed and screwed up more times with respect to my approaches to diet and lifestyle change than most people have ever even started. Yeah, And so I speak with a little bit of certainty when I say, look, you're welcome to go chase that and find out for yourself if it leads where I told you it would lead. And I'm not going to get in your way, but I'm not also going to be somebody who goes, that's a great idea and lets you go off and do it and run off a cliff like a lemming because you didn't pay attention. Um, there, Like when you really were like, okay, mm-hmm. so, now so, starts the train, you know, I'm going to do it. So, so, so sure. So, you know, I had lost some weight when my wife was pregnant and we had been trying for seven years to have a baby. You know, it was celebratory, right? You know, pizzas and everybody wants to take you out and have little cakes and whatever else. And you've got to do this and you've got to do that. And, you know, it's it crept back up a little bit, but then it went back down. I mean, there was a period of 18 months where I was doing everything right. You know, eating the right macros, weighing, tracking every single piece of food that went in my mouth, making sure that nutrient density was on point, kind of following that sort of paleo primal first principles thing, you know, really kind of putting all the pieces together. And for 18 months, I didn't lose a pound. I would maybe lose a pound, then I'd gain a pound, then I'd drop two, then I'd gain three, then I'd drop one, you know, but I hovered right at about 300 pounds for 18 months. And so you went from 505 to 300 and then you kind of hung, that was a plateau-ish thing. So for you. I went from 505 to 440 to 500 to 400 to 430 to three. So, I mean, there were these yeah, big yeah, chunks exactly. and big swings. You know, I tell people all the time, when you're as big as I was, you really don't have to worry about macronutrients. You know, you're, you're not going to have a problem. You're not going to have a molybdenum deficiency when you can eat 9,000 calories and still lose weight. 
Right. Well, that's the thing too. So you're so large. And that was the thing about reading that that's crazy to people to think about. So you might have been eating 12,000 that got you to 500, but on your way down, you actually, you didn't go to 1200 calories a day. You were actually still eating massive amounts of food, but at least it was edging in the right direction. Correct. So, you know, we went down that path. And so, you know, I was really working at, and I've got a bit of a background in research science. And so I was comfortable with, uh, you know, really looking at the clinical studies and really understanding a little bit about it. And so I felt pretty comfortable. Look, I've got my macros dialed in as I started to get further down the path. But then I suffer a little bit from like a bright, shiny object in a squirrel's mouth. Um, you know, not only is it bright and shiny, it runs real fast. And so I have to go chase it. So went through the fads of, you know, fats of free food and it does calories don't count and sort of chase that rabbit and ended up proving that was completely nonsense when I gained 30 pounds. Mm-hmm. Um you know, and being told by people in that space, oh, your body just has to normalize first and then it'll stop dropping. No, it doesn't. Yep. Um, you know, went from there to the fasting thing and being convinced that the answer to all life's problems was fasting. Um, fortunately, by that time, I was small enough that I could actually get into a bod pod machine and get measured. And I was seeing how fast lean mass was falling off of me with a fairly accurate, you know, 5%, 7% error rate. And I was dropping lean mass because I just wasn't eating. You know, I would go through periods of, you know, two days on a, you know, 48 hours and I was eating three days a week and, you know, there were just issues. And so I chased a bunch of fads. I finally sort of kicked it in, in earnest. Um, About two years before I ended up having surgery for skin removal, uh, which was about three years ago, I, uh, I had this decision that I was going to try this protein sparing modified fast. And um, basically it's a really high protein, almost zero carb um, with some refeed type days kind of baked inside of it. I don't know if I've actually been to hell, but I'm pretty certain that this was as close because I also had this idiotic theory from a paper that I found from like the 1920s that suggested that you could create these sort of undulating periods of eating. So you weren't really fasting, but you also weren't really feasting. And then I coupled it with this protein spare modified fast. So about three days a week. Now, mind you, I'm training two hours a day in a gym and working a full-time job and trying to run an online community. And on my low calorie days, I was eating 600 calories, basically chicken breast or protein shakes. And I tell the story enough because it's, it, it makes people laugh or grosses them out, one of the two. But I said, you know, you know you've gone too far when your diet when you lay on the couch after a workout after having tried to make it up the stairs three times before you finally made it and you contemplate whether it would be a better option for you to have to clean the couch professionally or to get up and walk to the restroom um i could not mentally make myself get off the couch and it was it was a photo finish as to whether I was going to get up and go to the restroom or whether I was just going to, well, we're buying a new couch, um, (laughs) sort of a moment. Um, (laughs) and I just, I I remember talking to Luis at the time, we had already kind of been working through the keto gain stuff and I'm nothing if not a glutton for stupid punishment. And I said, you know, Hey Luis, this is the thing I've been trying out and I've lost like 40 pounds and it's really cool. Also, I almost crapped the couch today because I couldn't motivate myself to get off the couch. And he's like, that's stupid. Do something different. And so How I simple, just. simple, brutal, clear. <laughs> Love it. Love him for that. So, <laughs> so kind of got it in gear, finished up that last 40 pounds or so that I wanted to lose before surgery. Um, you know, and then after I was weight stable for about six or seven months, just went ahead and had uh, a almost seven hour surgery with two uh, plastic surgeons, multiple nurses, two anesthesiologists, uh, partridge in a pear tree. And uh, you know, how'd blah, that blah, go? Blah. How'd so, the surgery go? It went well. I mean, I, honestly, I, I think part of it is, you know, when you eat a really micronutrient dense diet to begin with, and you really try and focus in on the quality of the food, not just the food in general. And you've been training like an idiot for, you know, several years leading up to uh, the physical pain wasn't bad. Now I'm a weirdo in that, you know, I've said this before, I've spent so much of my life trying to avoid pain, which was a lot of what, you know, emotional pain and physical pain kind of coalesced the same. I, 
I actually don't mind and even don't mind introducing pain to my body. Stupid things like taking the dog for a walk barefoot in the snow or, you know, I'm not, you know, out here with lips and flagels and, you know, like, let's not, let's not spread that rumor, yeah. but, um, <laughs> you know, but, but just trying my best to find ways to remind myself I'm still alive and I'm still, you know, I'm still not going to be at some point and that as of now I'm still alive and I should live. And, uh, you know, so by the first day after surgery, once I, you know, I was out of the hospital the following morning, uh, actually the nice thing about having surgery, Luis's fiance is a plastic surgeon. So she was sort of the lead on the whole thing. Um, you know, was staying at their house for recovery. And by the second day or the first day home, I was taking nothing but tramadol and was able to do like air squats and go for a walk and whatever I wanted to do. And, what was but your about thought the, about the actual results? I mean, we can't see your full body naked before and after. So were you like, um, were you like, oh, yes. I'm really, I was really excited. It was a little bit of body dysmorphia to see yourself in that light when all of this loose skin was gone. Yeah. Um, and I would be lying if I said it wasn't kind of a difficult thing still to look at yourself and say, hey, wait a minute, this still doesn't look like me. You know, it, it, I was never that lean, even as a college. I mean, I was lean as a college football player and lifter, very lean, quite frankly, but I was also big. I mean, I was, you yeah, know, two, 235, 245, 250, you know, pushing close to single digit body fat, you know, 1800 pound three lift guy. I mean, I was a strong, big dude to see myself looking almost frail was a weird sort of a mental image to get my mind around. And I was very happy with the outcome, but I tell people all the time that come, you know, that, that do consults with me about, you know, getting ready for plastic surgery or getting ready for, for big cosmetic change, that very topic, it is not the physical pain that you will have a problem with. If you are, if you are mentally prepared for it, what you're going to have a problem with is the identity crisis that you have somewhere during the process and you're going to have issues with being left to lay in bed or sit around doing nothing. And your mind is going to start playing that tape over and over every time you walk past a mirror, every time you get into the shower, every time you everything, you're going to go, who the hell is that in the mirror? That's not me. That's weird. You know, and, and I think over time you develop an, oh, yeah, that's me, you know, kind of a thing. But there's still this, you know, sort of a moment that you have if, you know, you've maybe had a night of imbibing a little bit or you're in a new place where like uh like it happens sometimes when i'm in a hotel room and a travel like at a speaking engagement or something you know i'll i'll wander past and i'll like there's this big tall mirror and i'm like shit like you're ready to fight because you're just waking up you're like <laughs> wait that's me um it's weird it's it's a very odd i don't know how else to like what to compare it to for people that have never been through that to say it's something but Imagine waking up one morning parent trap style and not being the person that you went to bed as. That's the well, closest thing I've ever gotten to. I, I, I heard an interesting story from a, a guy friend who went out with a girl who was extremely fit, athletic, like everything's great. She, she looked like she worked out all the time, never had a problem. Um, she's drinking a lot of dinner though. And he's like, okay, she, uh, all right. Maybe she's a little bit of a lush. Okay. And he's like being sweet. He's like, oh, I don't know. Maybe she eats something, whatever. Long story short, I guess after that, they're like hanging out at a, a lounge or club type of thing. And she just starts bawling, crying. And she like lifts up her shirt and shows the scars from her stomach, stomach stapling surgery, whatever that, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, she's just bawling. And long story, the whole thing was basically like, Yes, she had gotten the surgery. She had lost the weight. She had not dealt with and really what the thing, what we're getting at here, right? This, mm -hmm. this like change of perspective or for, cause you know what, they can do the surgery, but that doesn't mean you're getting coached properly mentally to adjust to this too. And I think that, so that's why I'm glad you brought that up. Cause I think that's an important thing for anybody who has significant weight to lose or particularly if you're morbidly obese, you know, there are going to be mental, emotional things that go along with that new person you're seeing in the mirror. And, um, you know, surgery is, is not just going to fix the, 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 the I, mental I had, stuff. I had over a decade to see myself getting smaller. Yeah. Yeah. And honestly, I'm thankful for it in retrospect because it taught me a lot of the lessons that show up in this book, but also, you know, introduced a sense of patience and a, and a timeline for me to decompress from what I was to where I was going. Yeah. And I still wasn't ready for what I saw in the mirror the first time that I looked at myself after surgery. Sure. What, what, um, okay. After you, 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 you know, 
you're not morbidly obese anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, you, I'm assuming, don't have any breathing problems. I don't. My wife will complain I snore, but mostly because there's an 80 pound <laughs> dog on my head. Now, did, did, was she also overweight and needed help? Did you do it together? My wife has lost about 125 pounds herself. She uh, was about, now she'll tell you she was 289 pounds, but that was six months before she decided to get healthy. Um, my suspicion is she was probably closer to 315 when she got started. So realistically, probably more like 150 pounds or so that she's lost. Okay. So, I mean, the relationship, I mean, it must be such a different story. Not only just like your emotions, your ability to like a mental capacity to like, and I'm assuming just energy things that you do um, has changed since you both have kind of gotten on a a healthier train. Yeah. So there's, there's two things I would say. Yes, definitely. The, the relationship is much less toxic and, and, you know, there was a lot of, of sort of self-loathing that manifested itself as enablement or, or even, you know, sort of codependent toxicity. Um. But I would also say, and I tell people this all the time, and Rob, I love Rob's expression for this. He said, when we had one member of a relationship join a CrossFit gym, we used to refer to it as diapers or divorce because every single one of those relationships always ended as either, hey, baby's pregnant or mom is pregnant or, hey, we're not going to be together anymore. I need to take her off of my account. Um And that's probably a ridiculously sort of draconian or a very broad version of that. But when one person in a relationship starts to change, they don't, I don't think people talk about this enough. The power dynamic between the two of them starts to shift as well. And there is a natural inclination for the other party to feel like they're being judged sort of, you know, vicariously by the other person trying to make a healthy behavioral change. And so what ends up happening is those people either come to terms with the shifting power dynamics and the other party kind of, they don't have to be all in with the other person, but they have to realize that this is being done for our relationship, not to exit our relationship. Mm -hmm. And that this is being done because I don't want you to have to bury me in a double wide casket. You know, those are, are things that, that have the conversations that have to happen. Um, and I think that a lot of times when we're in the process of going through change, it's hard and we don't appreciate how hard it is on all the people around us. It's not only hard on our spouses or our significant others, it's hard on our friends. You know, when you're used to going out and eating pizza and drinking beer at the same bar or at the same dive joint in the same booth every Saturday night forever. And then you go and you're like, no, I'm just going to have water. And can you bring me the chicken off the grilled chicken pizza and just put it on a plate? And look at you like you have face leprosy. You know, they, they, yeah. they, they're they baffled. And now it's, oh, he's too good for us. Or, or oh, right, he's, they're projecting this onto them. Like, oh, oh, so you yeah, think. Exactly. Like, oh, yeah. There's a lot I, I've, lo- I've lost friendships. And honestly, in the process of refining our relationship, it almost cost us our relationship. You know, right. it was hard. But would I do it all over again? Unfreaking questionably, you know, twice on Saturday and every day of the week. It's, yeah. it's what's given us the life that we have now, quite frankly. What, um, okay. So you've gotten to this point. Um, have you ever since you finally got to like, like your lowest or your best, you know, whatever within 10 pounds, like your, your goal weight or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, did you ever dip back into a horrible day or week of that monster, horrible eat? Did you ever go back to that? Even though it didn't sustain because you're clearly not 500 pounds, but did you ever like have a, just go, or did you never go back to that? Spiral. Did you go back for a week and they're like, oh, shit, I got to clean this up. So of all the weird consults I've ever done, and and I'll tell a two second story to get to the answer to your question. I got a phone call and I've actually got the voicemail still on my phone because it was surreal. Um, This this gruff voice says, you know, hey, Tyler, this is Stone Cold Steve Austin. I got your number from a friend of ours. And I was thinking about this keto thing. And I really want to get some insight on this stuff. And one of the questions when I called him back, we probably talked for two and a half hours. And one of the questions he had was like, do you ever just go crazy? And I was like, well, like you're a wrestler. So I need to define what go crazy means before I can say yes or no. And, and he said, do you ever just kind of say to hell with it? And I'm going to go do whatever I want. And I said, sure, not often, but absolutely. Um, and he says, well, well, what does that look like for you? And I'm like, well, I don't think you want to use me as a poster child for that answer. I said, but the last time I did this, it was a 16 inch extra large all meat pizza, 24 chocolate chip cookies, two pints of Ben and Jerry's and a two liter of Coke. And at two o'clock in the morning, I woke up 
in the floor of our living room, halfway down the hall, um, trying to make it to bed. Apparently, I had just decided that the spot in the floor was the perfect place to lay down and go to sleep. You were in such a like coma. <laughs> and I woke up in a puddle of dried drool, like all over my face and on the ground. And I just swore I'd never do that again. So from that moment, sure, I've had, you know, oh, Enlightened made a great ice cream and I wanted to try that flavor, but I also know not to keep it in my house as best as I yes. can, because if I have four pints, I'm going to eat four pints. If yeah. I have, you know, eight pizzas from Quest, I'm going to eat eight pizzas from Quest. There is just a, a, a realization that I know me well enough to know that if I keep healthy foods in the house, I'm going to generate eat more healthy foods. Or for example, like, not necessarily- I don't even keep nuts in the house because nuts for me is a slippery slope because I'll just- I just I- ate a few. <laughs> right, right, right. Like if I could just have a shot, who has a shot class of pistachio? I can't, I can't, you know, I got, so for me, I just kind of know that's a little bit of a danger zone. And so I don't keep them around because I'm going to overdo. And it, and it works because I forget about nuts until I see them somewhere. So yeah, that's obviously a key there. Um, all right. So let me, uh, gosh, there's so many good things in this book. Your conversation with Charles is great. We won't go into it, but there's a lot of really good juicy stuff in here. Cause it's not, this book is not about eat this, do this at 7am. Here's your diet. This is, this is my journey. These are all the thoughts I'm thinking. This is what brought me to this place of obesity and what brought me out of it. And I really like that. This is a really important book for people that are morbidly obese or really have serious binge eating issues and just feel like they can't stop. And one of the things you say in your book, which is true, a lot of these biggest losers, the people that lose, they don't keep it off. Uh, as you know, 98% of them fail. And so you wrote about that, how you're, you know, you wanted to see success. And I agree with you because you, you in the book talked about how you were like, look, it's nice that, you know, someone who is 200 went down to 150. That's not inspiring for me. I need to see people who went from my size and got down. And then you were kind of bummed because you'd look them up online and <laughs> you'd see that they gained back all the damn weight, which had they just done keto, they probably wouldn't have. Um, so, so just really interesting stuff in here. Also, um, gosh, I wish we had more time, but I want to touch on one last thing, which really resonated with me true is, um, Someone told you, and they've told me this before too, which is like, Tyler, you're tough to give a compliment to. And the thing that they said, which I, which is so perfect is they were like, when you do that, it feels to the person complimenting you, like you're rejecting not only their compliment, but also their right and worth to hold you in a positive regard, which I love that addition. And so you're like rejecting the person when you reject the compliment and you know, you had a couple of catch phrases kind of thing, like, you know, like what your response and stuff like, I'm just trying to keep it together. <laughs> just like all these negative, can you give us a few of those? Like uh, one, of <laughs> one of the ones that I was famous for was another day, another 63 cents after taxes or, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, if I was any better, there'd be two of me, you know, you always just have these sort of colloquial sort of sure things because you're just diffusing an uncomfortable situation and it's not uncomfortable for the the giver of the compliment it's uncomfortable for the receiver of the compliment. And that's what it was for me i would deflect every single compliment mm-hmm. you know it'd be like oh you look really pretty really like oh really this oh i feel like i look terrible and then that's really mm-hmm. like giving the middle finger to the, so i've learned to what you said just go thanks absolutely the one word one simple word yeah. thank you thanks awesome Cool. You know, whatever the thing is that fits your vibe. And by the way, women have a notorious different when, oh, you look really pretty. That really brings out your eyes. The first thing you do if you want to light disarm somebody is, oh, this thing I bought it at Kmart on sale. You start to devalue your clothing. We, we, we value 100%. We'll be like, oh, really? Oh, I got it like 10 bucks. Like you just, you like throw away everything. <laughs> it's false pride at being thrifty or yeah. false pride at being, you know, thrown together. It's like, there's nothing wrong with saying, thanks. I, I work my ass off two hours in the bathroom with this ridiculous routine to do this. And I do a really good job of color coordinating clothes, especially in the light for the, the low light of morning wake up and the sunrise and whatever. Like, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with just saying, hell yeah, I did, didn't I? This does yeah. look good on me. I look good in blues, you know, whatever that thing is. But fuck, we were so busy deflecting we're everything devaluing you- ourselves we're being we're we're shooting our confidence in the foot when we don't accept a compliment too and if, if only we knew somebody who wrote if only we knew somebody who wrote a book about confidence that i can't <laughs> somebody i can't remember who someone those listening <laughs> that don't know me, I do a book called confident as fuck you can grab that book um 
So now in your daily life, are you consistently keto? Are you sort of keep you flexible? What's your, what's your in general parent? So I have not departed from low carb keto. I, I, I get a lot of flack because people will refer to me as a carb apologist because I do think, and I think Mark would agree too, there are a lot of people who just do better at that 40, 50, 60 gram carbohydrate range than do at 20, 30 grams. And given your background with, with thyroid conditions and stuff too, there are a lot of, especially women who do really well at 30, 35 grams. But if I take them down to 15 or 20 grams, they feel like hell. That's right. And then the answer is, well, I have to stay at this range because I'm keto at this range, but I'm not. Shut up. If you feel bad, just shut up and, and eat your extra three grapes and chill, like whatever the thing is, right? Like that's the magic sauce. It's like we get, s yes, I'm about a 40 to 50 gram a day carbohydrate guy. And I have been for the last seven years or so when I realized that, hey, I do a little better with a little more carb. I don't need as much thyroid medication. I don't have, you know, as many fluctuations in mood. You know, there's a, a number of things that I found to be the case. Some folks in the community will say, well, that's just low carb. That's not keto. I don't really give a shit what you call it. I mean, at the end of the day, I lost 300 pounds. You didn't kiss my ass. You know, that's like right. and, it, and keto, I love that, you know, I love coach Tara Garrison's keto in and out, which is Tara's basically, great, Mark's yeah. system, uh, you know, metabolic flexibility. It's like, mm -hmm. Hey, in out, maybe it's 30 grams one day, 80 next day. Like, just go with it. Don't not eat. Cause you're not because you're hungry because you're a person that intermittent fast and you're not supposed to eat at this time. It's like, it's better off listening to your body if you're craving sausage at 11 AM, but you don't eat till two eat the damn sausage. Right. And I think, and that's why, that's what I love about you too. I, I know that you are. And that, that's why I also wanted to mention that because I, I don't want to turn off people to your coaching thinking like you're some strict keto person. You understand all the variables and you also understand that some things are right for people and not others. Um, and that's just gotta be the way I, I just, I can't handle with the, 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 the well, strong you know, it's, it's, those people, if they're keto for sometimes these people are either not doing it right, or they're lacking in dopamine and some other things mm -hmm. that, you know, they're restricting themselves into something that actually is unhealthy for them. So yeah, I love the flexibility. Yeah. If there's, if there's, if the diet's not working for you, then it's not going to work for you. And the reality is if it's not working for you, you're not going to work for it. And that's just the bottom line. If, if I try and take somebody and put them on a 48 hour fasting window and then throw them into three hours of jujitsu, guess what's going to happen? Right. After they crap their gi and pass out on the floor right, and somebody revives them, they're going to have to mop the floor because that's what your professor told you to do to clean up your mess. In the same way, if I take somebody who has a history of binge eating and I tell them to ad libitum diet without any real restrictions, what's going to happen? You know, well, I've gained 15 pounds. Well, show me your diet logs. Well, uh, I, you know, I've just eaten a few nuts. I've just had a little bit of cheese. I've just, you know, and I'm like, well, let, show me what a little bit looks like to you. Here's a knife. And the answer is like a quarter of a cheese block, you know, like that's a little because yeah. they used to eat a half. Right. And so that the challenge is that there is there's no one simple trick. There's no one diet that's going to work for everybody. The one thing I think we can all agree on is get the most nutritional quality for the foods that you're choosing to eat, yeah. you know, on a per calorie basis, get some exercise. The best exercise is always the one you're going to consistently do. Cut yourself some damn slack. I talk about the notion of this radical honesty coupled with radical grace in the book. Um, you know, and, and lastly, Tell people you care about that you care about them because, you know, the reality is you just don't know, you know, maybe you're not there tomorrow. Maybe they're not there tomorrow. And isn't that going to set things, you know, just cosmically, if nothing else, at, at a much greater peace when you can smile and say they knew that I loved them before they passed. Absolutely. If people would do those four things, they would ditch the neuroticism. We wouldn't have nearly the adrenal fatigue diagnoses that we have on a recurring basis. People would be much happier and there'd be a whole lot less uh, people piss fighting over who they voted for president. Very well said. I wish we had more time. We're out, but hey, we're going to put everything in the show notes to connect with Tyler. Keto Gains, G-A-I-N-S.com. Is that your main website? Where can we get the book? That is a that is our primary website. They can buy the book on Amazon at just about all the Amazons. I think I got one order from Amazon.jp, which is the Japanese Amazon the other day. And I was like, hey, I hadn't sold a book into an Asian market. That's cool. Nice. Um, they can buy the book there. Um, they can track me down somewhere if they want an autographed copy, but I don't uh, have any handy. Um, 
my own page is tylercartwright.com, but you'll find that it's just a giant picture of me. So there's not a whole lot of value there. Um, <laughs> just connect with me. It's tyler at tylercartwright.com. If people have questions, comments, want to talk to me. And you um, work with people all over. So don't be, you know, don't be turned off. If you're in another country or another city, you can work by phone and Zoom with Tyler. He can help you out. And all I would say is I've met Tyler in person and, you know, I didn't see the journey before he lost the weight. Um, but I've talked to him enough times and know that this is like probably the best person. If you've got a loved one who's really hating it, like he was, you know, if they're three, four, 500 pounds, this is the guy for your family member or you, there's just, there's no other one that's going to be able to understand and actually be able to get you there. I think personally, I would recommend you to, you know, everybody on that note. Um, thank you so much for sharing your story. There's so much vulnerability in this book. Uh, I felt like I learned more about you. I feel like, I feel like, Oh, I want to like talk to you offline, like more about it. Um, thank you so much for joining us again. And, uh, for everyone else, we can, you can look, you know, look into the show notes for all the links and we will see y'all next week. Thanks, Tyler. Thanks. So. Thanks everybody.